throat messed up and all that making a joyful noise has gotten to me today. So uh, we've been doing this series generous and today I want to kind of take a different uh, turn on on this because when we think of generosity, which we'll talk about in just a minute, we always go to finances. That's, that's what we do. We think about finances and we've kind of touched on uh, generosity being a, a, bigger, um, a, a bigger aspect of, of what giving is than just finances. It's actually a lot more than finances. Generosity has a lot of layers to it. And so today I really want to look at how we can bless others, how God has blessed us through generosity, um, and not necessarily the financial part of it, but the other part of it that sometimes we omit. Um, As preachers, we tend to do that. We omit things like that, and uh, we don't want to do that. So I want to kind of share with you... um, A few things to start this off. Over the past four months, you've heard us talk about this thing called Party with the Pastor. All right, Party with the Pastor is something we started four months ago, so we've done it four times. And uh, over the past four months, the last four times we've done it, I'll I'll put it that way because four months sounds like a long time. It's really not a long time. We've only done it like four times. But I have met personally over 60 new people at Bethel through Party with the Pastor. It's been a blessing. It's a blessing to me just to get to meet you, get to meet people that are new here that, that I, sometimes I miss going out in the lobby. And um, so it's been a real blessing. I wanted to take this time in this series to share uh, about this since there are new faces. So all the, the stories you hear, and sometimes you'll hear, you'll hear me talk about something that you have no idea what I'm talking about. So I want to kind of go back and get acquainted just a little bit. Um, and, and I'm setting you up for something in this message by telling you all this, so stay with me. Lindy and I just celebrated 24 years of marriage in September. So we've been married 24 years. That's a long time. <laughs> this past June, we celebrated 10 years at Bethel. So we've been in Bethel for 10 years, a decade of our life. Can't believe it. 10 years ago, we had no idea what to expect when we packed a U-Haul in Alabama and drove 21 hours to Rapid City to make this our home. Had no idea what to expect. To be honest, I came into this thing saying, I'm going to give South Dakota two years and then I'm going to move on. Just be honest with you. We had no idea what what God was going to do. We had no idea. We did not know what it was we were looking for in taking a position at this church in the Midwest, total culture shock to our system, but we knew what we were not looking for. Due to ministry experiences the 15 years prior to moving here, we walked into Bethel and South Dakota as a whole limping from some scars that we had received in ministry and life. We landed here at Bethel and experienced the love and support we had dreamed of for our next ministry position. From that day forward, we have experienced what I'm going to call tangible generosity that comes from the hearts of the people here. Generosity is part of the DNA here at Bethel. That's what it is. It's part of our DNA. The great thing about DNA is that when something is embedded in a culture, no matter how many new people come, they feel it and begin to adopt that culture as well. And we're seeing that now in our church. Church happens each week. People get saved and they get plugged in because of you, because of the people they meet. But when we came here, there was something more than actions that we were captivated by. There is an atmosphere of generosity that is still here each Sunday. From serving to giving, the atmosphere of generosity is contagious. Each week, it takes more than 60 volunteers to make Sundays happen, just to make it happen. That's the spirit of generosity. You see where I'm going with this? Some of you are like going, is he about to resign? I just heard that in my head. Like as I was, I was like, no. I don't plan on it. I I do plan on getting a fly swatter one day, though. (laughs) There's another one to the graveyard up here. Generosity is something that is alive and is bigger than us. It's something that every person here today and each week have the honor of tapping into if you choose. You have to choose it, though. It goes beyond us and beyond 
generosity or tangible generosity. It moves to radical generosity, which is what I really want to talk about today. I really want to talk about the idea of radical generosity. You see, radical generosity is more than a set of beliefs. It's more than theology or teaching or worship music. Radical generosity is something that is cultivated in a community. It's created. When I look at our church, I see so more than just finances when it comes to generous giving. Generosity sermons can often get tied to this topic of finances. And as I've said before, I believe that all churches should talk about finances because God talks about finances. So it's an important issue. If we don't talk about finances, we might as well not talk about sin because God talks about those things. So we should too. Financial generosity is without a doubt what allows Bethel to continue the mission that God has placed on us. So thank you for your unending generosity. But today, I want to talk about the spirit of what I believe has kept me and my family at Bethel for over 10 years. The spirit that centers on a generous God that has formed a lineage, lineage of love and freedom for every person who walks through the door, no matter your background, your bad habits, your sin, or your way of life. That's what I want to talk about. A generous God will love every soul that was created by him, even when we are not perfect. How many are thankful you're perfect today? I almost got you. Some of you are like, hey, me, praise God. Good, you need to be up here then. We're not, none of us are perfect. But God loves us anyway. A generous church will do the same. You know, we talk about revival. We've been talking about revival for a few years now. And when you think about revival, you got to think about the kind of people that revival will bring in. Okay? you got to think about that. Because if we don't think about that, if we're not prepared for that, if we're not ready for that, we're not going to experience it. And we have to have revival in our hearts, and it starts with us. And it's going to start with us and move to the heart of the church, absolutely. But I'm going to tell you this, the people that will walk through those doors when revival breaks out, we have to be ready for as well. We have to be ready for those that are strung out on drugs, that are looking for freedom. We have to be ready for them. We have to be worried, or we have to be ready for stains on our carpet from spills. I remember I was at church one time, and the pastor would get so mad because there was a stain on the floor, and he would lose his mind over it, right? And I'm like, dude, if there's no stains, there's no people because we're all going to make stains, right? We're all going to have problems. I, I can't tell you how many coffee stains are on this floor right now. Please be careful and put a lid on it, but I'm okay with it, all right? It happens. That kind of stuff happens when people are involved. So when revival breaks out, we got to be ready, not only in our own hearts, but we got to be ready for what God's going to bring through the doors. Yes. we got to be ready for that. Are we? When I was 16 years old, I went for my driving test. In Alabama, you, you get your permit at 15, and then you start driving at 16, because we, are, we have a brain a little bit. <laughs> this whole 14 stuff, I remember when Mercy was growing up, my oldest, and 14 years old, you ain't driving no car at 14. Are you crazy? So, 16 is when that happened. Went for my driving test when I was 16. I didn't do so well when it came to one-way roads. I failed the first time I took my driving test. It was all new to me. I mean, it was just, I'm in the middle of this place called Bessemer, Alabama. Bessemer, Alabama is one-way central. I mean, it's, every road's a one-way road. It's kind of like downtown here. And I just, the, the guy sitting next to me, I wasn't even thinking, and I just turned left. And he, like, you know, you could tell he had experience he's done this a lot because he's writing stuff down. He goes, uh, yeah, you just turned the wrong way. Watch out for that car. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, you know, trying to find a place. I, I, I mean, I was just going against the flow, you know. And uh, so anyway, we get back, he makes me park and fails me my first time. Um, it was all new. I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. It was all new. From that day until now, I understand what an anti-generous spirit looks like. Why wasn't he generous to me that day, you know? 
I think every new driver should have a sign on their car, at least for the first year, that says in big, bright words, I'm a new driver, I'm navigating a lot. Right? We should have that blinking. Every teenager, every teenager should have a sign on their car that says, I am a new driver, have patience with me, please. Right? Same with people, though. Please be generous to me. I'm navigating a lot. I think people should have that sign as well. I'm figuring things out. I'm in a health crisis right now. I'm at an intersection in my life, and I don't know what to do. I'm navigating this thing. Because, see, I feel like when we start realizing that everybody's navigating, the grace and the generosity that God has for us starts coming out towards other people when we start realizing these things. How many have a problem with uh, road rage? Yeah, right. Those signs would help you a lot, wouldn't they? Y'all have the cars up here that says, has a student driver on the hood of it, like on the roof? Student driver, and it looks like a taxi. Student driver, and the poor, the poor guy or girl in the driver's seat is just, you could, they're embarrassed. It's all, I mean, they're just embarrassed, right, driving this thing. They know this guy next to them could care less. Sorry if you're a driver's ed teacher. But they're just ready to get done because you're, you've already scared the life out of them as it is. And now you got this blinking sign on your car that says, you know, student driver, Hands on the wheel the way you're supposed to do, staring straight ahead when all your friends are driving right beside you laughing at you the whole time, right? Those signs are good. As I look at Jesus' ministry, I get curious to see how he made his way through the days that seemed to be navigation without a definite landing spot. If you watch the, the life of Jesus, he goes in uncharted waters all the time. His whole ministry went to places that he hasn't been or, hasn't, or, or he wasn't sure how they were going to receive him or he knew that they weren't going to receive him when he went there. So there were uncharted waters. There were this navigation thing. The book of Luke is intriguing because the theme of generosity doesn't always seem to be the most obvious. But I want to look at it because generosity is at the center of Jesus' entire ministry. If you think about the way Jesus did things. So in Luke 4... We see Jesus, all right? I'm going to kind of set it up, okay? We see Jesus, who up to this point has experienced a lot of things. He has experienced a lot. He has returned from the Jordan River, where he was baptized by John the Baptist. Everybody remembers that story or or has heard that story, right? He's baptized by John the Baptist. He hears a voice from heaven say, you are my son whom I love. I am well pleased. You know, he, he hears the whole thing. You know, a lot of people get this misconception that a dove flew down and landed on Jesus. No, doesn't say that, okay? A bird didn't fly to Jesus. So we get this, this whole con- misconception about this, of what happened. And then he's in the wilderness after this. He's in the wilderness where he eats nothing for 40 days and is tempted by the devil. Which we're going to focus on that later because I think there's a lot in the temptation of Jesus that we find a lot of generosity in. Then he comes out of the wilderness and this is where he pick up. So Luke chapter 4 verse 14. Listen to this. This is a little lengthy. It's a few, few verses, but stay with me. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogue, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. Listen to this. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of the sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Verse 20, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked. Now, this is one of Jesus' many mic drop moments, is what we'll call it. 
You know what a mic drop moment is where you say something and you just go, I'm done. I don't have to say anything else and walk off. This is one of those. Now, reading it right off the bat doesn't seem like it would be because it's like he's just reading some scripture. But it was because every eye in the synagogue is looking at Jesus at this point. He began by saying to them, verse 21 and 22, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So he's telling them something kind of important. All spoke well of him. They were amazed and all this kind of thing. This mic drop moment for Jesus was not only in the content in which he speaks, but also because Jesus is reading this small section of scripture from Isaiah would have been noticeably short for a synagogue service. It's kind of like if you have a preacher that preaches 30 minutes and they get up there one Sunday, they preach five minutes and they walk off the stage and they're done. Everybody's going, what just happened? This never happens. This is not the way it's supposed to be, right? Because you guys love when I preach 30 minutes. But Jesus had this way of bringing in Old Testament scripture to put a twist on it. Jesus added a new element to the mission right here. He actually omits a small but pointed thing. So when you read what Jesus says, and then you read Isaiah, the same place he read from, Jesus actually stops short. Now listen. He ends by reading the words from prophet Isaiah. God has sent me to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, right? And he stops there. But that actually isn't the ending of the verse in Isaiah. This is what it fully reads. After the year of the Lord's favor, it says, God has sent me to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. He stops short. Why would he do that? Why did he stop short? Why did he leave out and the day of vengeance? Why did he do that? Because he is starting something new here where he begins to lay the building blocks of what it is to be a generous community. Because in that omission, Jesus is explicitly refuting the central organizing principle of justice up to that point, which was this, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That was what people taught. That was the teaching. An eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. Somebody sins against you. If somebody uh, uh, steals from you, you cut their hands off. You know, it was one of those eye for an eye, tooth for tooth moments and our, our, our teachings that were going on. And Jesus comes in. He goes, I have to show them what the generosity of the Father really looks like. I have to bring this into play. And I know their eyes are focused so much on revenge or getting something back. So I'm going to start, stop short, and I'm going to stop with, I'm going to proclaim that this is the year of the Lord's favor. And he's going to stop there. This is an interesting thing because one of the greatest portions of Scripture in the life of Jesus is found in his temptation. You talk about wanting vengeance. Just think if, if the devil comes at you and tempts you nonstop, which he does today, but in the ways that Jesus did, I mean, how, how tempting was it for Jesus to throw him off the mountain instead of jump off himself, you know? I mean, how tempting would that have been? I believe that the temptation of Jesus made Jesus' ministry stronger. It was strong. I believe that when we face temptation and prevail as Jesus did, it makes us stronger as well. So I want to take for a minute and break down this temptation of Jesus. I want to show you something. And I'm going to show you where generosity comes into play in this weird portion of Scripture where you don't see what we think with the human eye. We, we wouldn't see generosity. The generosity of God, which in turn becomes generosity in us because we are made in his image. And as we grow in him, we'll imitate his character in our lives. So... Stay with me because there is a generosity found in the temptation story. So kind of set it up a little bit. Jesus is in the wilderness, which what we will use as an example of, and this is what we're going to call it, the world systems of evil, okay? The wilderness. How many of you ever walked through the wilderness? You've heard the, you've heard the, uh, the, the old um, what example of I'm walking through the wilderness. I'm, I'm in the wilderness right now, but God's going to bring me to the other side. I'm in the wilderness. You know, that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at that as the world system of evil, the world in which we live in. The devil prowls in this system. 
to create dissension and take away authoritative power of the word and of the Christian. That's, that's what happens, right? I mean, he did that with Jesus. Why wouldn't he do that with us? So when the devil speaks in the world, he says this. Look at this world. There's nothing here. There's nothing that will be enough for you. There's nothing in abundance, only deficit. You will not encounter generosity unless you own it, conquer it, and construct it for your own gain. That is what the enemy tells the world. That's what we're looking at in the world society today. Generosity is not, it's a, it's a foreign language. Generosity is a foreign concept in the world we live in right now. The church hasn't forgotten about it. We, we've, we've strayed a little bit from it. We haven't forgotten about it. But the world is now coming against us, preaching that generosity is something that we, we can no longer attain unless we do it for selfish reasons, which is basically generosity for ourselves. So that's what we're looking at in this system. The first temptation of Jesus the devil looks at him and he says, since you are God's son, command this stone to be bread. It doesn't seem like much. And, and honestly, when you read that, when you look at that portion of scripture and that piece of, of, of the story, what harm would that have really been? Honestly, Jesus is, Jesus is hungry. Hey, there's a rock there. No harm, no foul. Nobody's looking. I'm just going to pick it up. I'm turning it to bread. I'm going to eat it. I'm good. You know, what, what's the big deal? You see? But the invitation is not to see if Jesus would use his power to turn a rock into bread. The invitation is to misuse power. That was the invitation. But even if that power causes a change that points to God, shouldn't that be good? Because if Jesus had done that, the story had got out, oh, Jesus is a miracle maker, right? He's, he's already performing miracles. But Jesus cares about invoking change with Community. So this is what Jesus says. Man doesn't live by bread alone. That was his response to what the enemy says. There is a more generous way. That was the first temptation. The second temptation, the devil takes Jesus to a high place and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. Everybody remember the story? I will give you this whole do domain if you will worship me. This is the temptation of political power. It's a, it's a temptation to be in power over everything else. Well, here's the thing, what the, what the devil forgot, and that Jesus, he already knew it, is that God holds dominion over every nation. So he already holds that, so you're asking him to take something that's already his. So why would this even be one of those things? See, Jesus isn't interested in trading his place in the kingdom for a throne in the destructive empire, not as the ultimate means of freedom. Jesus wasn't interested in that. He's not interested, I'm going to trade my seat at the throne of God for the power over everything on the planet that I already have power over anyway. He's not going to do that. And Jesus answered, it is written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve only God. He's a generous God. I'm getting to, I promise you, I'm going to bring this all around. The third temptation, the devil brought him into Jerusalem and stood him at the highest point of the temple. And he said, since you are God's son, throw yourself down from here. God will command the angels to protect you. Prove that you're God by doing X, Y, and Z. Prove it. It's a transactional way of regarding God. It, we do that. We do that sometimes. We know that we serve a generous God. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have, what, eternal life. So we know that God is generous in just that one thing, not counting everything else you see in the Bible. God is generous. He sent his son to die for us, right? So what we end up doing, though, is we say, God, I know, I know already in my heart that you're a generous God, but I need you to be generous right now in my moment, in the moment that I feel like you should be generous, and I need you to do this or that or that to prove to me that you are generous. God doesn't operate that way. That's a transactional way of regarding who God is. God is not a transactional God. He's a transformational God, right? So transactions with God doesn't work and probably doesn't make him feel too good. You know what I mean? He probably doesn't look at us really the right way when it comes to us trying to do transactions with him. Because 
He needs us and he wants us and he's created us to trust him in those moments. He will transform our lives in the moments of trust. Transactional is not how he works. So still based on authoritative hierarchical power, but what religion is about is transformation, real transformation. Changing our mind towards generous love, changing our heart toward a generous posture and community, changing our body towards living in, a, in the present moment, being generous to ourselves. The whole point of Jesus gets lost when our arguments are about proving something about God. Jesus isn't interested in proving himself. Understand that. This is what he says. It is written, don't test the Lord your God. He says that. When the devil says, hey, throw yourself off the highest point, Jesus answers with, don't test the Lord your God. God is more generous than this. Jesus rejects all of these temptations of power and individualism and realizes that the way of vengeance will not fit in this moment, in this teaching that he's given in the synagogue. See, I, I go all the way back to the synagogue. I wanted to show you the temptation here because you have to see where Jesus' mind is at this moment. He knows what kind of God he is. He knows what kind of God God is. So he's looking at this and he's going, okay, when I say the vengeance is God's, they already have this vengeful mind. So why am I going to reiterate that? Why don't I stop with this is the year of the Lord's favor so that they can see what kind of God they serve because they got this misconception of who God is. Jesus rejects it and realizes vengeance is not the way that will fit in this moment. He chooses a more generous, albeit messy, and hard way forward. He says, I'd rather be a new driver journeying along this freeway of life with everyone. So he puts himself in the people's minds, or in the people's, in the people's context. Otherwise, I'm held prisoner and captive, oppressed. I'm chained by the power of evil. I prefer the Spirit of God to be upon me. But I don't know, on one hand, this feels pretty obvious. Jesus wants to organize the kingdom of God on principles of love, generosity, freedom. Values that can hold and still flex and stand the test of time and still be alive. Our values here at Bethel are worship, serve, connect. Worship, serve, connect. Worship is our, is our passion. Serving is our focus, our calling. And connection is our focus. That's our values for the glory of God and the blessing of other people. I think these values can be pretty radical. If you think about radical generosity. Radical in Jesus' day and radical still today. Let, let's look at the word radical. Radical means in Latin to go to the roots. That's what it means. It means to go to the roots. In plant biology, how many biologists are here? Anybody? Any biologists? Good, because I can say anything and you'll just buy into it. <laughs> plant biologist. In plant biology, the radical is the primary embryonic root, emerging from the seed first to enhance water uptake. The new driver that funnels in the health and vitality of the plant, filtering what nourishment will go to the entire plant system. Jesus, as he makes his way through the temptations, returns to the roots and the histories and the legacies and the lineages of his faith to set up the new way forward in his kingdom. At each temptation, Jesus says, it is written, it is written, it is written. In scripture, it says, my roots offer me this. When you are walking through temptation, you go back to the roots of the very reason why you have authoritative power to withstand temptation that comes against you. This is your roots. That's why you have it. See what Jesus is doing? He's standing there. He's remembering all this. He knows what temptation looks like. He knows what his response is. He goes into the synagogue. He's standing there just before he steps into temptation, which is very cool because right now he's about to step into temptation, and he's going to have to put his money where his mouth is 
because he just told the people in the synagogue, this is the year of the Lord's favor, and he doesn't say the vengeance is God's. Then he steps into the wilderness, gets tempted three times. He looks at his life. He looks at everything going on going, wow, temptation means you thought about doing it. Let's get that real for a minute. Jesus, to be tempted, would have thought about doing it. I'm tempted to pick up that water because I'm thirsty right now. But I know I'm not supposed to, but I'm tempted to. That means in my heart and in my mind, I have a desire to do this because it will make me better. It will make me feel better. When Jesus is standing there in the wilderness and the devil says, take that rock, turn it into bread, then what am I going to do? I'm tempted to do it because I've been fasting for 40 days and I'm pretty hungry right now. So there was a temptation there. But what Jesus had to do is go, I remember in the synagogue when I said this is the year of the Lord's favor the spirit of the Lord is anointing me to preach good news to the poor the only way I can do that is to show them what it looks like to walk through the wilderness and come out on the other side without without falling everybody with me so far and so Jesus does that he plants himself in the wisdom of the scripture and he takes the heart of them he calls them to life, to the generous expanse that they apply to. And it's then he's able to state with clarity the mission for the community going forward. Jesus subscribes to a different social understanding. It's why after he handed the scroll back at the synagogue, everyone stared. They stopped at their dish, stared at him. Radical generosity isn't because... We try to be the best followers of Jesus or serve above and beyond, but rather to hold tight to our roots. The Jesus who stood in the midst of a synagogue said this, the scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. This Jesus is not of the past, but the same Jesus that sits with us today and says the same thing because if the gospel is to live this life as generous people, then preaching good news to the poor, proclaiming release to the prisoners, and recovering the sight of the blind and to give freedom to the oppressed, we are going to need some roots. We're going to need that. If revival takes place, we have to have something to stand on. We're going to have the roots. Jesus doesn't give us a social program with a clear strategic plan to do his work. But he does offer us two things that I think are critical for being radical, to walk in radical generosity, and to make it the change-making spirit that it can be. Here's the two things. Call out evil and heal. That is the two things he's given us. Call out evil and heal. If we had time to read the rest of Luke 4 today, you'd see that as Jesus leaves the synagogue, he starts immediately calling out evil. He starts that in his own ministry. He calls out a demon taking up residence in a man. He says, silence to the, to the evil. This is scripture. This is, this is just in the Bible, right? He goes to Simon's home and cares for his mother-in-law who has a high fever. If you remember the story, scripture says he bends over her and speaks harshly to the fever. And as the sun sets on the day, he deflects every evil that challenges or tempts to compete with a spirit of generosity. And he speaks harshly each time to it. He says vengeance, violence, conquering will have no room here, but generosity will be as powerful. To call out evil is radical generosity. Without Jesus and this radical generosity, we will be convinced that we are running short on everything, that life is full of scarcity, void of kindness. We'll believe that we are running short on love, on years, on time, on moments of happiness, of money. Scarcity, scarcity, deficit. That's the way we will look at things if we're not careful. If we don't allow the spirit of generosity, of radical generosity to come into us. But we can't be held captive by that narrative. We have captives 
to free. We have new drivers to greet. This relational spirit of generosity that guides our living can also heal us. Listen to what happened. The demons fled. Fever left. Trappings of evil held no power. And what is left is the clarity of the Spirit of God upon us, all of us. Radical generosity then can be experienced in abundance at every turn in our lives. In the words of the Peruvian theologian, Gustavo Gutierrez, I think, that's how you say that name. He says radical generosity is not only a call to generous relief action, but a demand that we go and build a different social order. Jesus was flipping the social order. He's still calling us to this work. Radical generosity starts with our everyday, ordinary engagement with other people, family, friends, strangers, your actual neighbors. Radical generosity is joining with the Spirit of God that is still moving today. I'm going to close with this. It is written, it is written that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, one that was sent not to condemn the world, but to save us. Generosity involves more than just money. It involves our heart motives and actions towards other people. That's what generosity includes. There are so many levels of it. There are so many levels of generosity that we have to understand. Financial, absolutely. Financial generosity is up there. And I believe God's called us to that. But there's so many other layers that we have to look at as well if we're going to talk about this topic. I'm not going to tell you what we're going to talk about next week because uh, you might not come. But I, I, I'm going to encourage you to be here next week because we're going we're to finish up this series and we're going to talk about the financial aspect of generosity and what that looks like. No, I'm not going to beg you for money or anything like that. I promise you we're not going to do that. But we have to look at the whole word. We have to look at the whole word of God, and we have to look at the entire makeup of what generosity is all about. Can I pray for you this morning? Heavenly Father, I love you. Lord, I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful for the complexity yet simplicity of who you are. And God, I pray today as we as we get ready for Thanksgiving, as we embark on this week full of family and friends and food and all the glorious things you have, I pray, God, that we'll always remember radical generosity, how we can be generous to other people, love other people, understand that there are a lot of new drivers out there just navigating. And we may be, we may be those as well. So, Lord, I pray for help, that you'll help us, that you'll guide us, you'll direct us, give us your wisdom.